Before I start on the really big stuff, Ghislaine Maxwell was on British television, well, Rupert Murdoch's television, which not many people see, of course. But how does that work? You're serving time in a US penitentiary for serious crimes against children, and you get to appear on TV. Well, she told a harrowing tale of the difficulties of being a vegan and being in an American prison, how boring the prison diet was. She told a harrowing tale uh, about the murder of her paramour, Jeffrey Epstein. But it seems the particular purpose of the interview given by Ghislaine Maxwell on Rupert Murdoch's TV was to exculpate Prince Andrew. Now, we're running a poll. Is the photo of Prince Andrew with Virginia Jouffre fake? You can vote on it on our Twitter handle, on my Twitter handle, on my YouTube channel, and on my Telegram channel, and on the YouTube community channel, and thousands of people already have. We're asking, was that photograph of Prince Andrew fake? Well, I've got to confess to you, I believe it is fake which makes it all the more surprising that Prince Andrew gave her 12 million British pounds, presumably supplied by Her Majesty the Queen, as was, God rest her soul, and therefore our money, British taxpayers' money, 12 million smackers, even though Prince Andrew says he never met the girl. So he walked up to a girl he'd never, ever met and gave her 12 million pounds rather than face her in court? Some mistake, surely. But anyway, on to the really big stuff. Germany has declared war on Russia. Don't take my word for it. Take the foreign minister of Germany's word for it. This very day, in the Reichstag, in Berlin, outside of which stand two Russian tanks from the last time that the Russians visited Berlin in earnest in May of 1945. They were placed there so as to warn revanchist German politicians that making war in Europe with the Iron Cross on your livery should never really be done again because the last time it led to the death of the best part of 100 million people around the world. It led to the Holocaust whose memorial we respect and revere again this very day in which 6 million Jewish people were systematically, industrially massacred in a genocide. It led to the massacre in the gas chambers of Roma, of disabled people, of communists and trade unionists. It led to the triggering of war throughout the world, this German fascism. Those tanks would appear to have lost their historical resonance, because according to the German foreign minister, in a so-called socialist, so-called green government in Germany, literally declared war this afternoon. We are at war with Russia, she said. Just as an aside, as a matter of international law, that now would permit Russia to invade Germany, to bomb Germany to bomb that Reichstag right now because the German government has declared it is at war with Russia. Well, of course, two can tangle. Luckily, Russia is unlikely at this point, at least, to do that. But the proximate reason for the foreign minister's extraordinary statement was that the German government had decided to send their leopard tanks, or panzers, they call them, 
in Germany into the hands of the regime in Kiev to fight the Russians with. I don't know if they'll scrub off the Iron Cross, but whether they do or they don't, whether it's called a leopard now as it was a tiger in the Second World War, it's a panzer. It's a German panzer rolling over the Ukrainian border to fight Russians. You feel me? You see where I'm going with this? Of course, militarily, these leopards will be snuffed out before you can say, I don't know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, whose father fought alongside those panzers in the Second World War. But before you can say Arnold Schwarzenegger, these tanks will be wiped out. In fact, Russia would be legally entitled right now, right now, to destroy those tanks before they even reach the Ukraine. But they probably will not. But as soon as they hit the earth, the, the Russian air superiority will snuff them out. They will be burning husks on the Ukrainian steppe very, very quickly. They will be militarily insignificant. There are a dozen of them, or maybe two dozen. If you add in the ones that went to the Netherlands, that went to Poland, let's say there's a hundred of them. Let's say there's 150 of them. Russia has 15,000 tanks, plus total air superiority over the battlefield. So the life expectancy of those tanks and the tank crews, who will be Ukrainian, of course, the EU is ready to fight to the last drop of blood of the last Ukrainian, but they will not be in the German tanks themselves, at least not at this point. They will be destroyed. But the sending of German tanks has certain, I spoke to a Russian this very day, a woman I'd never met before, a woman in exile from Russia, a woman with absolutely no connection with the government in Moscow, a woman with absolutely no political support for the president of Russia. But she was sure as mad as hell at the fact that German armor is once again going to be fighting Russians because her grandfathers, you see, fought in the Great Patriotic War, which I remind you cost the lives of 26 million Russian citizens. 26 million Russian citizens were killed the last time that German armor crossed the Ukrainian border. Can you think of anything more incendiary? Anything more inflammatory? Can you think of anything more escalatory than sending German tanks to fight Russians? Are these people insane? But of course, this woman I spoke to today, who hasn't been in Russia for decades, is not untypical of what Russian public opinion will this evening be doing. A new war fervor will be sweeping Russia this evening. And all of the paraphernalia of the great patriotic war will now be seen everywhere on the streets, in the windows, in the hearts and minds of the Russian people. Are these Western leaders insane? Well, You've got to wonder about that. I don't mean Joe Biden. He is clearly insane, no longer in control of his faculties, either at the top or the bottom of his personage. But what about the others? What about little Macron? What about little soldier Schultz? What about little Rishi Sunak? Isn't it extraordinary that none of these people are any taller than Napoleon was. He once said that Russia was a colossus with feet of clay. And not long after he said it, the Russian army was in Paris. Yes, 
at the Champs Elysees in 1814, the little men in charge of our national and international affairs and the soft in the head, at the head of the war coalition of NATO led by the United States are leading us literally to disaster. And nobody is doing anything to stop them. Hardly a voice in the Reichstag raised against it. And I salute those few voices that did. Hardly a voice in the French National Assembly and no voices at all in the British Parliament where another very little man is sending British tanks, not for the first time, of course, to fight the Russians. Churchill did it more than a hundred years ago, sent a hundred thousand British and Commonwealth soldiers, Empire soldiers, they called them then, at least they were honest, to fight to try and regime change the government in Moscow. But we are doing it all over again. Nine of them were sending. That'll make a big difference on the battlefield. Of course not. But the big man I want to turn to now, the big fat man, the big fat man that once watered the workers' beer from Downing Street, the big fat man Boris Johnson, the big multi-millionaire public speaker who's just been revealed by the Sunday Times as having given the chairmanship of the BBC to a man who stood guarantor for a personal loan to Boris Johnson of £800,000, virtually a million dollar loan, without anyone knowing about it, least of all in the BBC or in the British Parliament or in the British Civil Service in Whitehall or Her Majesty, none of them knew that this man had stood guarantor for Boris Johnson's loan of a million dollars. And eight weeks later, he gave him the chairmanship of the BBC. If that was happening in, I don't know, Ukraine, we'd be calling them one of the most corrupt countries in Europe. In fact, that's what we used to call the Ukraine before it became plucky little Ukraine to whom we should give all our money and all our weapons and maybe eventually all our life's blood. Boris Johnson was not facing the music in the British Parliament about his payola with the chairmanship of the BBC. He was in Kiev. Why was he in Kiev? How was he in Kiev? Who paid for him to go to Kiev? Whose interests was he serving in Kiev? What did he say and do in Kiev? None of us know that. But he was certainly given a red carpet welcome by little Zelensky, another little man, the former porn actor and comedian now president of the Ukraine, posing there, little and large, with big fat Boris Johnson. What was Boris Johnson doing there? Who was he representing there? Who was he speaking for there? And what did he speak about? I labor this point because, of course, Boris Johnson was the man sent there by Joe Biden in May of last year, to ensure that Zelensky did not conclude a peace agreement with Russia at the talks in Turkey, which Zelensky was then inclined to do. Was that what he was sent there for again? And who sent him? I think we have a right to know, don't we? After all, he is still, believe it or not, a serving member of the British Parliament. I think we have a right to know what is being done 
behind the scenes because the scuppering of that peace deal has had very grave consequences, not least for the 150,000 dead Ukrainian servicemen. 150,000 dead. Add the maimed and add the wounded forever and add the mentally deranged as a result of the trauma that they have suffered, then the best part of half a million Ukrainian men have given their life's blood or their sanity or their limbs into this charnel house of this war of attrition, which has now been grinding for 11 months exactly this day. And every day that has passed since Boris Johnson scuppered those negotiations has made the price of an eventual settlement rise. Medvedev, the former president and former prime minister of Russia, now member of the National Security Council of Russia, added to the bill this very evening when he said soon the regime in Kiev will have no sea at all. And that's what I have been predicting now for months. Russia is now crushing the Ukrainian army and it is sweeping towards the sea. It will take not only all of the east of Ukraine, but all of the south of Ukraine. Western Ukraine will be a rump Kosovo-style NATO encampment, entirely landlocked and entirely dependent on your taxpayer largesse for the rest of time, just like the NATO encampment of Kosovo torn from Serbia and installed as a proxy waiting to prod the Serbian people and their brotherly Russian allies whenever the time is right. This price is rising every day. As German generals are pointing out today, as the former Prime Minister of Japan pointed out today, when he said, is it wise, is it really wise to be investing all this in the war in Ukraine, which it is inconceivable that Russia could lose? Is it wise? You decide. No, I'm talking to you right now. And I hope that you are listening and that by the end of this week, the best part of a million people will have listened. But I couldn't do it from a platform in central London, even at the Ethical Society. Because here's what happens when you try to speak up in British democracy in this freedom-loving, once-upon-a-time, freedom-fighting country of mine. Take a look at what I put out earlier this week. We'll come back to it later on, because I've got to go to one of the most important of all our American guests. He's Chris Hedges, and he's coming up right now.